Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel, Ed. Douglas McGregor alleges that Ukrainian soldiers have uploaded videos depicting Russian prisoners of war being sexually murdered after surrendering. These videos, purportedly taken by Ukrainian soldiers themselves, have been shared online, seemingly as a display of pride and an attempt to intimidate the Russians. McGregor suggests there may be further motivations at play, hinting at a broader agenda within Ukraine, particularly in Kyiv, to ensure that there can be no negotiated settlements between Ukraine and Russia, not so much due to the people in Kyiv who might be willing to talk. Growing fear that Washington will ultimately abandon them, he suggests. Aware that Ukraine fatigue is not confined to Europe, but also prevalent within the United States, he emphasizes that they are well informed about the news. They anticipate that the new Republican Congress may be less supportive than the previous one. Under these circumstances, he believes they want to make negotiations nearly impossible. One tactic being the posting of videos depicting the murder of opposing soldiers. For this, he contends, poisons the relationship with Russia and complicates any potential agreements, especially for President Putin, as the Russian people are outraged by such content. He dismisses previous accusations against Russia, labeling them as propaganda concocted by Ukraine and eagerly spread by Western media. However, he acknowledges the existence of genuine videos, one of which depicted an alleged attempt by Ukrainians to stage a fake Russian attack on civilians. Despite initial attempts to remove these videos and investigate, he suggests the lack of follow-through indicates a deliberate strategy by those in Kiev to prolong the conflict and deter U.S. abandonment by hindering Russian negotiations. No, it's not reckless at all. First and foremost, it's important to understand the context of what's happening now. This strategy bears resemblance to historical actions taken by the United States in conflicts such as Iraq and the Balkans, as well as during World War II against Germany and Japan. The approach involves systematically targeting crucial infrastructure such as fuel networks, storage facilities, distribution centers, and even power plants on a large scale. By disrupting these vital systems, the aim is to severely hamper the enemy's ability to function normally. This tactic proved highly effective in past conflicts. This current strategy in Ukraine is seen as long overdue and forms part of a broader plan to prepare for future offensives. The the attention behind such actions is clear. Why allow the opponent to operate comfortably if there are plans for a significant ground attack? Initially, there were hopes for negotiated settlements. Consequently, the focus shifted towards a strategic defense posture, aiming to conserve forces while preparing for an eventual offensive. With the onset of colder weather, a major offensive may be imminent in the coming weeks. It's essential to note that when discussing these strikes, Instead, they are ordered by the high command of the Russian theater and executed accordingly. The precision of these strikes is a crucial aspect to consider. Modern capabilities allow for incredibly accurate targeting, minimizing collateral damage. This precision was demonstrated during past air campaigns where military targets were struck without harming nearby civilian infrastructure. Similarly, the Russians possess this capability and can execute strikes with great precision, as seen in recent actions near the Polish border. Regarding the nuclear power plant, particular attention is drawn to the facility near Zaporash, Shia, which is heavily guarded by Russian forces. Ukrainian attempts to target this plant reflect a dangerous escalation with a potential to spark a nuclear crisis. However, the Russians are vigilant in protecting such critical infrastructure aiming to prevent any catastrophic outcomes that could arise from such attacks. Yeah, well, it's not merely about preventing Ukrainians from utilizing it. They're actually safeguarding that plant from Ukrainian attacks. What they've done is disconnect the power transmission from these plants to Ukraine, and this action will persist. We need to pause and grasp the cascading impacts of these attacks. They affect every aspect of life in Ukraine, not just transportation and water, but also rural livelihoods, including livestock farming and agriculture. With farmlands lying fallow and livestock facing starvation due to the inability to feed, move, sell, or care for them, the Ukrainian economy is being devastated, resulting in almost non-existent output. 
When considering the timing of potential offensives, Ukrainian experts factor in weather and terrain conditions. The Ukrainian black earth topsoil, known for its fertility, can vary in depth from 4 to 15 feet, depending on the location. This soil freezes deeply, posing challenges for movement, whether by truck or tank. While temperatures have recently dropped below freezing, they need to remain so for at least two weeks for substantial freezing to occur. Based on this, a significant offensive could occur around mid-December. As for the composition of Russian troops, satellite imagery and intelligence reports suggest approximately 540,000 Russian troops, along with a substantial array of armored vehicles, artillery rockets, missiles, drones, 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 aircraft, and bombers equipped with precision. Munitions. The aim is to dominate various aspects of warfare from ground operations to close air support. More efforts are being made to supply more equipment to the Ukrainians. However, Ukrainian casualties have been severe, especially in recent months, with reports indicating significantly higher Ukrainian losses compared to Russian casualties. The disparity in casualties and resources underscores the dire situation for Ukraine, with ammunition, spare parts, and fuel in short supply, and many soldiers lacking proper training and experience. Time is no longer on Ukraine's side as the situation grows increasingly desperate. He would begin by presenting a map illustrating the identified concentrations of Russian forces, highlighting their significant firepower and maneuverability. Additionally, he would provide an honest assessment of Ukraine's current fighting capabilities, describing them as very modest. Given the dire conditions faced by the Ukrainian population, including severe shortage of power, water, and fuel, he would argue that it's not surprising the Ukrainian government is advising citizens to evacuate. Even Klitschko, the mayor of Kiev, has urgent residents to seek shelter elsewhere as the capital city faces a mass exodus with millions of Ukrainians heading westward. This could result in a massive humanitarian crisis as refugees pour into neighboring countries, many of which are already overwhelmed. Regarding President Zelensky, he believes that Zelensky would comply with directives to negotiate and accept the reality of the situation. He stresses the seriousness of the conflict, likening it to a state of war where any unauthorized presence near military installations would result in immediate detention. When discussing the American journalist's potential involvement, he speculates that the journalist might willingly share information with the CIA due to his anti-Russian stance. However, he emphasizes that the journalist's proximity to a Russian military installation during wartime would likely lead to his apprehension. As for military equipment, he mentions the preparations for the deployment of American M1 series tanks, while German Leopard tanks and Bradley armored vehicles have already arrived. He highlights the lethality of various weapon systems, such as the Cornet missile, which poses a significant threat to tanks from long distances. However, he stresses that the integration of various equipment types rather than the arrival of individual weapon systems is crucial for effectiveness on the battlefield. In conclusion, he asserts that these developments are unlikely to change the overall situation significantly. He would explain the concept of active versus passive defense, where active defense systems include various measures like small explosives embedded in armor to detect and counter incoming threats. However, he notes that most active defense mechanisms only work once, leaving the vehicle vulnerable after being struck. Additionally, there's currently no effective defense against top attack missiles, which pose a significant threat by targeting the thin armor on the turret's top. He mentions ongoing efforts, particularly by the Israelis and Germans, to develop innovative solutions to this challenge. Regarding recent developments in warfare, he acknowledges the emergence of new threats that undermine traditional armor tactics, such as the ability to neutralize mobility on the battlefield. He likens the situation to the introduction of machine guns in trenches during World War II, which fundamentally changed the nature of warfare. He emphasizes that addressing these challenges will require time and innovative solutions, as current military preparations are not adequately adapted to the evolving battlefield. Discussing the Wagner Group, he refers to statements made by Rogozin suggesting deliver a Russian tactics to turn certain areas into meat grinders to systematically destroy Ukrainian forces. 
He believes this strategy has been advantageous for the Russians as it forces the Ukrainian military into a challenging environment that limits their maneuverability and effectiveness.